Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, mona muluwanji, namaste, jumbo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so happy and so, so very grateful that you're joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show, and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Laura Simp. She's here to celebrate the Clackerty. Before we invite Laura into the studio, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok. Check out our reading with your kids page on Pinterest and on YouTube. And of course, if you are on Twitter, we are at Gently Magic. And of course, we would love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. So many great things happening on our website. Our new online magazine will be launching in December. You can sign up for free. We'll also be making announcements. We have a great new companion project coming your way. It's called Drawing With Your Kids. Some of our great illustrators that have been guests on the show are going to be teaching you and your kids how to draw the favorite characters from their books. Learn all about that and more at readingwithyourkids.com. Join us right now from the great state of Washington. Our guest is returning to the podcast. She was recently part of our um, Halloween special event. She was part of the uh, Spooky Authors Group who came on and read their original short story that I gave the title Trapped in the App to. Um, she's back today to celebrate her her. Middle grade novel is called The Clackety. Please welcome to the show, Laura Simph. Hey, Sam, Laura, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me this morning, Jen. I'm super psyched to have you back on. First, again, thank you so much for being part of our Halloween special. Oh, it was so much fun. It was, um, it was, it was great to collaborate with four other spooky writers, and I was, I was pretty excited about what we, uh, what we came up with. It really was. Um, at the end of the of the story, we I I kind of asked everybody. I said, "So, what's the title?" And people were like, "Oh, I didn't <laughs> think about a title." So I gave one, but I think it, it was it was really fun. And the way, if you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out. The way it came together is I simply gave uh, Aaron Petty, or one of the members of the group, a prompt, a very mm-hmm. simple prompt. I don't even know if it was a full sentence. And they took it, five, the, the five authors took turns writing. And, and it wasn't, oh, what do you think about this line and this line? But no, each author had a chance to write their own section. So I think Aaron started it, if I'm not mistaken, or Sarah? I think Kim started it. Kim, I right, think yep. it was Kim. So Kim Ventrella started it, and then she passed it along. So Kim didn't know anything about this, uh, what was happening in the story uh, other than the, the few paragraphs that she wrote. And she heard the rest of the story at the end of the night right. during the reading. And it's so much fun. And I think you were the um, final author. I wrapped it up, yes. You wrapped it up. That's a, quite an intimidating spot, that cleanup spot. You know, it is. And I'm not sure I would have willingly done it. I <laughs> frankly just um, forgot to say, hey, my turn. So when it, when it came time to clean it up, it was, it was me. <laughs> well... It, it it was super, and you did a, a great job, and we loved it. And I know anybody listening to it would love it. And I have a feeling, based on your writing for that project, that anybody picking up the clackety would love that. Tell us oh, all about this you. story, please. Sure. So the clackety is uh, the story of 12-year-old Evie, and she lives in Blight Harbor, which is the seventh most haunted town in America per capita. And she lives there with her Aunt Desdemona, who happens to be the local paranormal expert. And Aunt Des doesn't have a lot of rules, but she does have one, and that's to stay out of the abandoned slaughterhouse at the edge of town. Now, Evie obeys until she doesn't, because one day day Des goes in there and Evie follows her. And 
fairly soon, Des disappears into the slaughterhouse, and that's when Evie meets a creature called the Clackety. And the Clackety makes a deal with Evie um, that if she is to go into this very strange neighborhood of seven houses, um, make her way through, she can get her aunt back. And Evie doesn't really have much of a choice. Clackety doesn't seem like a creature to be bargained with, but 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 Evie figures she got she's got to get her aunt back. And so she goes on this adventure. She meets some some pretty questionable characters, makes some friends, and hopefully gets her aunt back by the end of the story. Wow. Meeting up with pretty questionable characters sounds like my neighborhood. <laughs> I hope your neighborhood's not like this one. <laughs> not 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 my current neighborhood, the one I grew up in. <laughs> Who would have thought um did did you ever in in your life growing up think that you'd ever have to write the sentence um I I I I was warned not to go into the abandoned slaughterhouse? You know, I always kind of hoped I'd write a sentence like that. I've I've always loved spooky stories, and so uh, so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that my debut is a is a spooky middle grade story. Why do you think kids love spooky stories so much? Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose I have a few thoughts on that, and I think many kids are probably like me and um, nervous about things in the world. I know as, as a kid, I definitely was an anxious kid. And a lot of things scared me. But I found that um, scary books didn't scare me. That was a place where I got to practice being brave. Because it was a safe place, right? If, if it got too much, I could close that cover, walk away from it, go back when I was ready, or not at all. But it's where I got to practice being brave. And I think that's one of the things that um, the kids really do like about a spooky story. Is that they get to be a hero. They get to be brave while they're reading that. And I think a lot of kids are also kind of kind of like me and a lot of other folks and just like to be scared. Mm. It's it's fun to be scared. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's strange. I, I, I've shared here on the podcast before. I grew up loving spooky stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an author here in New England, Edward Rowe Snow, and he wrote many books about haunted houses and haunted islands and uh, shipwrecks and, and whatnot. And... From there, I went into Stephen King, and and Mm -hmm. I I read The Stand, and I can't believe I read The Stand. It was like 30,000 pages or something. Right, right. (laughs) But once my son was born, there was and I was in the middle of reading an Anne Rice novel, and when my son came into the world, I couldn't pick that book up again. Mm -hmm. There was Mm -hmm. something that happened, and... Mm -hmm. There was like no, and I'm not going to, I can't read spooky stories, um, watch some horror movies with my kids. My daughter got into a, a when she started in third grade through eighth grade, she loved watching the ghost hunter shows and sure. uh, she didn't want to watch them alone. So I would watch them with her, but it wasn't until my recent cross continent epic adventure that I dared read another Stephen King book again. I mm. listened to it and um quite good. Um but I don't know what it was when my son you know, when I became a dad, it was just like I, I don't want to go here anymore. I, I understand that. I think my version of that, um being a lifelong horror fan, so I started reading scary books with John Bellers when I was very young. Um he wrote the the one everyone knows is a house House of the Clock and Its Walls. And that was turned into a movie a few years ago. But Bellers interest introduced me to horror. And so I've always been a fan. And then after having um, my kids, I've got twins. I no longer am able to read stories where children are the victims. Mm. Um, I can read stories where bad things happen to kids if they're heroes, if they if they have agency and are the heroes in their stories. But, but books, and this normally happens in adult books, of course, not children's books, where kids are just victimized. I, I don't have the stomach for that anymore. And mm-hmm. I it, it, it is one of the few things that will make me put a book down and not return to it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That could have something to do with it. Um, the good thing is that in middle grade novels, kids are very often the heroes. And they're mm-hmm. able to defeat those monsters and gremlins and ghosts and goblins. Oh, absolutely. I think that's the beauty of it. Um 
I, I have sort of a contract that, that I enter into with my young readers and their grown-ups, and it really actually comes from something I've told my kids about TV and movies. If we watch something spooky together, I always tell them, guys, it's a kid's show, so things are going to be okay at the end. It's going to be okay. You know, get through the spooky, because it's going to be okay. And I realized I owe that to my readers as well. And so it's pretty short and sweet, but really my contract with my readers is, listen, I want to take you on a spooky adventure. And scary things are going to happen and bad things are going to happen. But if you take my hand and trust me, we're going to get through this. And at the end, things are going to be okay. They're not going to be maybe perfect, Mm -hmm. but they're going to be okay. And I I truly believe that that's part of writing age-appropriate horror, is that you owe that to your audience. It's interesting. Just this past weekend, I was at the Boston Book Festival and uh, had a conversation with a, a, a publisher who publishes books by authors from Latin America, and he, mm-hmm. he publishes them in, in Spanish. C- occasionally he translates them in English. But I asked him if he thought there is a, a difference between the children's literature that's coming out of Latin America and the children's l- literature that we have here. He said the biggest difference, other than language, of course, was that he felt that... Um, there are a, a lot of authors here in the States write with a lot of filters and mm-hmm. that the mm-hmm. authors from Latin America don't have those same filters. And as a result, they're, they're, the books don't always have a happy ending. Sure. And it's interesting that, that you were saying you have this contract with your with your audience that, that may, may not be a totally happy ending, but things are going to be okay. It's um, going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if that's... Um, and and I I have no idea. I haven't thought about it more uh, and, until right now. I I wonder why there is that contrast between, you know, um, things don't always work out in stories from Latin America and here in the states, books for kids things usually do. You know, that's really an interesting question. I don't have an answer either, but I think it's it's worth um, thinking about, and it's it's worth because the answer's there, right? Mm-hmm. We could find the answer if we looked for it. Um, but that that is very interesting. Well, we're we're looking to d- dive into that subject. I have an intern working with me, um, originally from Ecuador, and we're gonna try mm. to explore that. So, stay tuned. Be sure you subscribe to the Reading with Your Kids podcast, and uh, in a future episode, we'll we'll be talking about that. In the meantime, um, was there anything in particular that inspired the Clackety? A few things, I suppose. So big picture is when when I finally decided after all my life wanting to write a book that I was going to really do it. Um, I knew that I wanted to write something spooky for kids because that's what it meant something to me growing up. And I really knew that I wanted to write something that could sit on a shelf next to Coraline because I think Coraline did something really interesting with proving that kids books can be scary and strange and still very appropriate for their readers. And I thought, okay, I want to write a book that sits on that shelf. Um, didn't really know where to go with it. And almost exactly four years ago, my sister sent me this funny text message that said haunts from Heloise, like hints from Heloise, but mm-hmm. haunts. And uh, she's like, I don't know what to do with this. This is yours. Have fun with it. And I did. I started writing this really silly um, advice column from, from the perspective of what ended up being Aunt Desdemona. And it was all paranormal advice. And I was sending it to my sister and we were having fun with it. So I had a character, but no story. Um, six months later, I was in Butte, Montana with my husband, which is where he grew up. He said, there's this building I've got to show you. It's it's amazing. You're going to love it. Ended up being an, an abandoned building that had once been part of a slaughterhouse system. And so I immediately jumped out of the car, left my family and went and trespassed in this building, um, as one does and fell in love with this building. It was beautiful and, and very, very haunted. I'm certain very haunted. Um, so I had a building and I had a character, but I, I didn't have a main character. And I thought, well, I, I want to write an authentic child, and the child that I would understand would be one with anxiety, because that was the kind of kid I was. And then I thought, well, what happens if you take a kid who has very significant anxiety and panic attacks, and you drop them right into the middle of a horror story, and they have to be the hero? What Now what happens? And that's really, those are the ingredients that Clackety came from. Interesting. Interesting. As... And this is an aside. As, as somebody who dealt with anxiety as a kid, do you think that maybe one way that that 
we could help kids with anxiety is give them stressful situations to kind of let them see that uh, oh I can I I I, I can um, I can deal with this. Uh, maybe, maybe. And I, again, I think books are a good place to do that. That's mm-hmm. a place to introduce the scary that's safe. Mm-hmm. I think um, what I would have benefited from, I was a kid in the 80s, and so we didn't talk about anxiety for kids. You were just kind of a weird kid if you, if you, if you had those, those fears. Um, I think really w- there's a lot of power in naming things. So I think if we can name things for children rather than making them mysterious, that, that, hey, this is just anxiety and it's just a thing that you have and it's a thing that you can deal with. And then we name it and then we give kids tools. So something you'll find with, with Evie in the clackety is she knows she has anxiety and she has seen a therapist and she has tools to work through it. So we have, we have to equip them, right? We have to, if, if a kid is struggling with these things, we have to name it and then empower them. And I, th- I think that goes a really long way. Yeah. I, you mentioning the eighties. It's when you think about how we've evolved since the eighties and how we've evolved since I was born back in the turn of the last century. Um, we're at the point now where we can, not only are we talking about anxiety, but we're talking about kids going to a therapist, and that's a typical thing. No big deal. I mean, in the eighties, that you you wouldn't let anybody know. That's right. That's yeah. right. And now it's just, it's just not a thing, Yeah. which is wonderful. It, it's, it's so wonderful. And I'm so grateful for the kids growing up now that yeah. that, that is the more common reality. It's mm-hmm. not, ev- not everyone's reality, mm-hmm. but it's, it's certainly more common. Yeah. What was it like walking around that abandoned slaughterhouse? Well, uh, again, I love to be scared. Um, so I, I, was kind of overwhelmed by it, to be honest. It was um, just this, it, it was very open. It, it's, it's been cleared out, um, very open. At the time, the first time I went in, there were windows. Many of them were broken. Um, something that struck me as very interesting is that there was nothing alive that I could hear in there. There were no birds or bugs. I, I couldn't hear anything. And really, there should have been. It was in a very um, overgrown field with trees. There should have been living things um, spending time in there. And so the silence really struck me. And um, as, as I walked through on the back wall, and this makes its way into Clackety and becomes very important, somebody had painted dozens, maybe dozens, of uh, bird silhouettes on the back wall. All sizes, some looked like they were very near, and some looked very far in the distance. And, and that was such a, an incredible image in that desolate building, um, to see all those birds mid-flight, along that back wall. So the, the whole building was very surreal. Um, again, to me, to, to my eye, very beautiful, but also very scary. Um, mm. I, I'm the first to say I wouldn't go in there alone at night. I, <laughs> I wouldn't. As much as I love it, I wouldn't. Yeah. Do you think part of the, the eeriness, you mentioned the, the silence, was part of you thinking there when this place was in operation, this was probably a very loud place with lots of sounds of anguish and, and suffering. Well, certainly. And anytime I go into a space and, and there's that kind of silence where there shouldn't be, my thought is, what are we hiding from? Mm. If, if, if we're all in here and we're being quiet, what are we hiding from? And, and so that, that obviously was a thought that led me to, well, what might live in there that, yeah. that would keep, Everything either out or very quiet. You know, it's it's interesting as somebody who's dealt with anxiety that you love to kind of put yourself in these anxious mm-hmm. anxious moments. What was it that helped you go from someone that that, that this was a um, it w- was a victim, not victimizes in the, the white word, but who, someone who suffered from anxiety mm-hmm. to now somebody who's like, yeah, you know, I kind of dig being scared and anxious. You know, I, I, for me, there's a difference between feeling anxiety about something and being scared. Okay. They're, they're two different things. And I really was, was kind of one of those hard headed kids and probably the same kind of adult. I'm determined to prove that I'm brave and tough. I'm determined. And even if I don't feel like I am, I'm determined to prove to myself and everyone around me that I am. 
So I, even as a kid, I would have run into that abandoned building. Um, and I would have done it in the dark and I would have done it with a flashlight and I would have done it before everyone else because I was going to prove that, that I was as brave or braver than the next person. Um, even if I wasn't feeling it inside. And so I suppose that's just a habit, a mm-hmm. muscle that I built over the years. That's cool. That really is cool. Is there any kind of other exercise that you use that helps you conjure up these spooky scenarios and stories? Oh, you know, I, I feel like these things are always living in the back of my head. Um, that there, there's always a spooky story or something scary happening that I'm sort of pondering in the back of my head. So they're not hard for me to access. Um, but I, I do ask myself as I'm, as I'm writing a scene or as I'm writing a character, um, what, what scares me? Because if I want it to be scary to my reader, I feel like I need to authentically be a little bit afraid of it myself. And so when you read a book like Clackety or the sequel that'll come out next fall, um, the things that, that are scary in that book are things that scare me. And then I do also ask myself, you know, how do I make this a little bit more? This scene or character, how do I make it a little scarier or a little stranger or just a little more and, and dial it up just a bit. And that usually helps me as well. Very cool. I'm, I'm wondering, boy, you know, my, my beautiful wife and I have been married for 33 years and we love spending time together. But I think of my my wife, and oftentimes when I'm on stage in in doing my weird things, that my wife will look at me and go, I can't believe I'm married to you in that mind. (laughs) Um, Does your husband ever look at you sometimes and go, man, I am married to someone who comes up with some really weird ideas? Um, If he does, he hides it very well. (laughs) He knew, even before I started writing, he knew that I was weird. And and so none of this is out of character. I'm just, I'm just taking it up a level. There you go. That's, that's very cool. It's, I think, I think weird is um, something that brings people together. Oh, I agree. I I am, I'm proud to be weird. Um, I've got my, my kids like to comment that we're the weirdest family they know. And they say it with a lot of pride. And I'm like, guys, we're probably not, but you know what? If that makes you feel good, sure. We yeah. can be the weird family. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we always celebrate the fact that uh, our our home is uh, our Thanksgiving and our Christmases and our cookouts are like the um, uh, land of the misfit toys. Love N- it. None of us fit together, but we all love being together. Yep. That's yeah. perfect. Hey, Laura, where can we go to find out more about you and find out more about the clackety? Sure. So you can always go to my website and that's just laurasenf.com. Um, I, you find, you can find me way too easily on Twitter. I spend far too much time on Twitter. So that's Laura013 and real easy to find. I'm on there all the time. I love hearing from readers. Um, I'm on Instagram as well. I'm trying to learn Instagram. I'm not very good at it, but Laura Senf author is where you can find me there. We've had a really fun time speaking about the clackety with the author, our guest, Laura Simph. Hey, Laura, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you. It was wonderful. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guests will be Michelle Lazurik and Chris Bowman. They'll be here to celebrate their great new kids book. We hope you'll be here to celebrate with us. If you're the author of a fantastic children's book, please be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author's click here button at the top of the page to find out how you can be a guest here on the podcast, to find out how you can be part of our monthly promotion program, and also find out how you can submit your book to our certified great read panel. Learn all about it, that and more by going to readingwithyourkids.com and clicking on that author's click here button. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Laura Sim. Please be sure to check out the Clackerty. Also, want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Stephanie Davila, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.